Pharmaceutical companies marketed drugs to you illegally. Now they're paying the highest fines in U.S. history. This is the American Law Journal, made possible in part by Scheller PC, winning large verdicts for people injured by dangerous medicine, including antidepressants and antipsychotics, as well as medical malpractice and products liability claims, and the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers. Tonight on the American Law Journal, blowing the whistle on Big Pharma. Did aggressive marketing tactics get doctors to prescribe drugs that people didn't need? or worse yet, that might have caused them harm. Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. Welcome to the program. We're coming to you live tonight in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. You're gonna see that 1-800 number in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. I hope we'll get to your phone calls somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes after the hour. How is it that the two largest pharmaceutical settlements in U.S. history have taken place in just one year? Our producer, Valerie Jones, gives us a look. Two behemoth drug companies, two historic settlements. In less than a year, pharma giants Eli Lilly and Pfizer have been hit with the two highest penalties ever for false claims and health care fraud in the marketing of pharmaceutical drugs. I'm honored to stand here today with dedicated colleagues from within the Department of Justice as well as beyond it to announce a historic settlement with Pfizer Incorporated. In a combination civil and criminal settlement, Pfizer has agreed to pay $2.3 billion, the largest health care fraud settlement in the history of the Department of Justice. Pfizer eclipsed Lilly's groundbreaking settlement in January by almost a billion dollars. Pfizer ignored government warnings about the danger in sales of certain drugs. FDA has issued an alert to health professionals on emerging safety concerns about the antibiotic Zyvox. The study showed that patients on Zyvox had a higher chance of death than with any of the other drugs. In the case of Zyvox, which is a very heavy-duty antibiotic, they were given a warning letter, which is the most serious thing the FDA can do. They ignored that. These cases would never come to light if not for insiders, company employees who witness fraud, who then come forward to authorities and blow the whistle. Attorney Jim Pepper is a former pharmaceutical sales rep. I know what it's like to be a sales rep in the pharmaceutical industry. I did it. I did it uh, for the better part of five years. I know what it's like when a boss says to you, uh, Jim, if you don't break the law or, or something to that effect, if you go, don't push the boundaries and, and put yourself in, in harm's way in order to increase sales, uh, you will be fired. Pfizer released a statement admitting wrongs but moved quickly to put the past behind them. We regret certain actions taken in the past but are proud of the action we've taken to strengthen our internal controls and pioneer new procedures so that we not only comply with state and federal laws but also meet the high standards that patients, physicians, and the public expect. Pepper says he's heard it before. Four separate times this decade, Pfizer disregarded the federal law about promoting drugs off-label. What these whistleblower lawsuits do is they say to pharmaceutical companies, hey, listen, you are not going to put working men and women who are trying to support their families in a box and force them to make a very hard choice continue to support their wife and children, or your husband and children, or break the law. What can consumers now expect? Will these settlements change the way drug companies do business? For the American Law Journal, I'm Valerie Jones. And to answer those questions tonight, my four guests on the panel with me, Anita Hotchkiss joins us for the very first time this evening, a trial attorney with Goldbert Segal, over 30 years experience handling complex pharmaceutical medical device and other product liability matters. The Honorable Richard Klein is with us this evening and Judge Klein has been on the bench since 1971, a former Court of Common Pleas judge in the city of Philadelphia, former administrator of the Mass Torts Program, and now an appellate judge on the Pennsylvania Superior Court since 2001. Stephen Scheller has been representing injured individuals since the 1970s in uh, pharmaceutical and other product liability matters as well as general personal injury. His firm, the Scheller firm, involved in both multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical settlements 
in the past year. And Alan Jones is a former member of the Pennsylvania Inspector General's Office. Earlier in the decade, he blew the whistle on state employees who were taking money from drug companies. And it's good to have him with us tonight. Once again, folks, 1-800-426-4625 is our number in the studio. We're going to try to get your telephone calls in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Well, let's take a quick look here at one of our graphics that will uh, kind of uh, at least highlight the facts of the Eli Lilly case. This Eli Lilly case came down in January of 2009, and the total uh, settlement number was $1.4 billion, and it's centered around the drug Zyprexa, which is an antipsychotic. Up until this point in time, that was the largest settlement in U.S. history. Now, shimmy down the road about nine months or so, and this largest settlement, this largest penalty is eclipsed by the Pfizer settlement. In September of 2009, Pfizer settled the drugs involved. Geodon, which is an antipsychotic, much like Zyprexa, Lyrica, and Bextra deal with pain. And Zyvox is a very strong antibiotic, $2.3 billion. Steve, obviously you're intimately involved in these, these cases, so you know some of the details. What is the egregious conduct that went on behind the scenes, both with Lilly and with Pfizer? Well, the main egregious conduct was the two companies engaged in what we call illegal marketing, off-label marketing. In other words, they were pushing the drugs for uh, things that they were not approved by the FDA for. In other words, sleep uh, uh, and they were uh, and other things uh, other than schizophrenia and the things that they were originally approved for. And in addition, worse yet, they in the case of Pfizer. They had warned to, four times, they had been warned to stop this kind of conduct and ignored it. And worse yet, the drugs were being marketed, diminishing their adverse event profile. In other words, claims were being made that they didn't cause diabetes or they didn't uh, increase the risk of death. Uh, and that was the most dangerous aspect. Many people suffered very serious injuries. Some died as a result of the illegal conduct. It seems like all of these big numbers that we've seen actually in the, over the last decade or so, Anita, uh, are basically because of off-label marketing where drug companies are actually getting doctors to prescribe drugs for maladies or problems that the FDA did not approve them for. When I mean, you go back five or six years ago, I think Neurotin had been the poster child for you know a large uh, settlement, a large uh, criminal civil, civil uh, settlement, 2004-2005. Uh, it's all about off-label marketing, isn't it? it? That is the poster child of du jour, I think, uh, and the flavor of the week, if you will. Uh, years ago, I think we saw a lot more kickback allegations, but there's been tremendous changes in the pharmaceutical industry, I think, in the last uh, 10 years and in other areas as well. And I think the companies have really very robust compliance programs in place now. What's distressing is that because the incentives are so huge, the billions of dollars that are out there both for the government but for the relators, the whistleblowers, that people in companies are incentivized to go to the government and try to bring an action against the company through the Quitam statute, rather than to report the conduct within the company. And there are, there are hotlines, there are other ways that, that the employees can now uh, report such misconduct. And Alan, I know that you're our whistleblower on the program tonight. What was it that you were trying to do? Obviously, you saw something fraudulent going on. You saw something that was off kilter. What did you see and why did you take the action? I saw state employees receiving large amounts of money from pharmaceutical companies to speak in their official capacities in the promotion of treatment guidelines that favored the use of the atypical antipsychotics. Such uh, as Risperdal, Such as Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Geodon. Okay. And additionally, these drug companies were funding uh, the development of this treatment protocol in the state of Pennsylvania, importing it from the state of Texas. It was a very favorable program for the drug companies. It would result in tens, if not hundreds of millions more dollars in Pennsylvania. Let's get to your telephone calls next. I believe Mike in Stroudsburg is up next. Go ahead, Mike. Good evening. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, my daughter, who was five years old at the time, was prescribed Risperidol. Oh, After a little bit of research, uh, the only way I could stop this treatment was to refuse to give it to her. Uh, I was later excoriated by the doctor later on um, in court. Um, the, uh, the materials put out by the pharmaceutical companies clearly state that that drug is not to be used for 
people under 18 years of age. Seems to me it's more marketing than medicine. And how, how can you stop doctors from, from doing this to kids? Well, and Mike, let me ask you, as a lay person who's gone through this, two things I'd like to ask you. Was your, was your daughter put on antidepressants before antipsychotics? No. Okay, just went right to the antipsychotics. And uh, do you believe that it's as much the drug company's problem or fault as the doctor? Where do you put most, as a lay person, where do you put most of the responsibility? Well, I, I put the responsibility in the doctor. Whatever efforts are used to market to the doctor, he has the, the, he's learned the end of the line. He's the, the, he's the learned intermediary, maker. right, Anita? Right. And that, that, that's what I wanted to, to address because we're talking about off-label use as though it's inherently evil. But doctors, as, as the caller points out, can use a drug for any purpose that they want to. They're not bound by what the approved uses are according to the FDA. When, when a drug goes through this 12 years of approval, they finally get to a point where the FDA says, this is what your label has to say, say, and these are the indications for which you can promote the drug. But there's a very fine line between what's promotion and what isn't. And if doctors start using a drug for other purposes, which they often do, and which, for example, in the, in the, in the case of Botox, which is used for spasticity, it's not approved for spasticity, but a lot of people who are post-stroke or who have other problems have spastic muscles, and, and they can use bo the doctors use Botox to stop that spasticity. The FDA has has said that this is a good thing that's happening, and now there is uh, studies going on to get approved for that purpose. Well, there's no doubt but that they, there's some the good off-label off -label use. Good off-label use. Sure, where the drug companies get into into an ambiguous situation, which can be called over over marketing or over promotion, is if a drug, if a doctor says, I understand the Dr. Smith down the road is using this drug for spasticity, can you tell me anything about that? And it's perfectly legal for the company to then give that doctor studies that have been written about using the drug for spasticity. However, they cannot say to them, you should use this drug for spasticity. And that apparently and seems to be so what has happened, especially with Risperdal, uh, Steve. Well, I know that you've yeah. handled a number of Risperdal cases. And, you, and, uh, you, and, and Mr. Jones, he's involved. Risperdal, yeah. in my opinion, should not be permitted on the market. Not permitted on the market. I want you to understand that. And the reason it shouldn't be on the market is it, it has a very high rate of causing diabetes. It causes a, a problem called uh, gynecomastia, where boys grow breasts, and if the breasts don't go away within a year, they often need double mastectomies, and these are significant percentages. This drug was approved recently by the FDA to use with children uh, for autism, and it causes what's called tardive dyskinesia, Parkinsonian type syndromes, all kinds of movement disorders, and yet that drug is being given to children. God, under, I cannot understand how the FDA got, let it get by for children with autism. And if you read the warning labels, it's tucked away about gynecomastia. The drug company in this case understated the, uh, in my opinion, the adverse event profile and the significant number of people that suffer adverse events. And more importantly, what we are really facing with these things is Harvard University. Dr. Biederman was paid millions of dollars to create science to support the approval for the FDA. The conflicts of interest. Senator Grassley, a Republican, has been after Harvard. He's been after Stanford. How do they allow these reputable universities to put their name behind a doctor who's been paid so much money and an institution who receives so much money to support the science that is really not just bad science, not just junk science, but garbage science? Well, we're going to get, I'm, I'm sure we'll be dealing with antipsychotics in the upcoming 12 months. Let's Let's get back to your telephone calls. Lisa from Bucks County is next. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, thank you for airing your program tonight. You're welcome. Um, back in 2005, in response to repeated custody battles, I developed a clinical depression, and the doctor insisted I take Risperdal. I am a clinician myself and said I didn't want the Risperdal. I, it's an antipsychotic. I'm not psychotic. Lots of documentation of depression, no psychotic disorder. Um, as a result, I became very impaired from the drug, begged her to take me off of it. She would not. 
went to a hospital where once they took me off of it, I was fine. I have documentation of this. In the process, I lost my children's primary custody for being impaired. What kind of recourse do I have? Well, I'm going to give that to, to the plaintiff's attorney and let Anita comment on that as well. Go ahead, Steve. Well, the problem you face, again, this is a, a very serious, serious problem. You know, this kind of uh, situation where you're uh, in a position of having to hire a lawyer to protect your rights. You, we don't know whether the doctor that gave you Risperidol uh, was on the payroll as a speaker. We don't know whether he was influenced, though probably he was, by the literature and the conduct of the famous doctors such at, at Harvard or Stanford and, and other universities. Those are very serious problems. And yet you've been subject to being given this drug, obviously it sounds like off-label, and yet you, you're supposed to go out and spend thousands of dollars for lawyers and the court itself is in a very bad position because they bring in these experts from Stanford and Harvard to testify how wonderful this drug is and all the good things about it not knowing the thousands of documents that are under court seal today in the state of New Jersey that we as attorneys have been fighting for their release a three judge private panel uh, of judges order, requested and wrote an opinion saying they should be released and the company Janssen has appealed that decision you need to see those documents there's no reason that these confidential do these documents be kept from the public the public needs to have sunshine Senator Grassley's been trying to do something about this Congress has these companies are powerful when you got billions of dollars at risk you will take steps to do stuff that they sh that, which is what they are doing we need to take steps to protect our public and I thank you for your call I wish I could give you better news but that's where we are now you need to really hope that and take steps to support Sen the senators such as Grassley who are doing something about this problem and uh, Lisa you can call our office during the week again 888-78-LAW-TV uh, we'll try to get you uh, moving in the right direction see if there might be something we can do uh, to help you let's go to I think it's Pla uh, Pamela Pamela is up next on our show. Go ahead, Pam. Oh, hi. Good evening. Um, hi. My first comment is about these pharmaceutical companies with these um, settlements. Don't they leave themselves open for private lawsuits? And also, the doctors who are prescribing these medications in question, aren't they aware of the possible side effects of these drugs before they prescribe them? Well, they should be. You would hope that they would be. I've heard, Anita, that sometimes it's difficult for doctors to read every single piece of information that comes across their desk. They would like to, but in today's healthcare system, they are not always able to. So they have to almost rely on the literature they're given. Well, I, I, I'd have to disagree with you there. There is, a, there is a booklet called the Physician's Desk Reference, which every doctor gets every year, and it's updated a couple times during the year. And that booklet gives all the indications, side effects, risks, uh, adverse reactions of every drug that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in this country. Now, if the doctor's using it for another purpose, well, that, that's on the doctor. And as Steve says, you know, then there are issues that, that a plaintiff's attorney will, will, will explore of whether there was over-promotion to the doctor. But doctors, as I say, can use a drug for any indication that they want. And, and they are responsible for knowing all the information that is, that is given to them in the physician's desk, desk reference. And the manufacturer is pro prohibited from handing out literature to them that is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration. I'd like to respond to that, if I may. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, the PDR lists only the side effects that have been disclosed. They do not list the side effects that have been hidden. The side effects that are not disclosed through deceit and deception and jury-rigged uh, clinical trials. Uh, and I disagree with an earlier comment that the, these doctors prescribe these drugs spontaneously, particularly in the case of uh, children. There was a concerted effort exposed in these suits and others uh, by the pharmaceutical industry to market these drugs through uh, juvenile psychiatrists or child uh, psychiatrists. What earthly reason can be given to justify marketing these drugs to child psychiatrists when there were no FDA approved indications for the use of the drug and yet the drug companies focused on 
child psychiatrists as a growing market. And uh, just to follow up on one of Steve's comments, Risperdal is approved only for a very narrow indication in autism. I think it's agitation in autism, not for autism spectrum disorder. And the approval for that arose from a single study uh, that involved mentally retarded children institutionalized in the state of Texas. So I would again submit that the science supporting that very limited usage is uh, not very solid. And yet the sounds like the gentleman caller before who had the prescription for the five-year-old uh, most likely fell outside of that very narrow approved indication. If I can jump in a second. Yes, um, by all means, Judge, go the, ahead. The, there's only so much that the justice system can do to handle situations like this. I think one of the things we're learning is that, you know, doctors aren't perfect and pharmaceutical companies aren't perfect. But we're in the modern era where there's lots of information out there. If you've got, I would think if you've got something major where a doctor suggests you're undergoing a major treatment of, or major medication, you ought to get a second opinion because they're not all right. You ought to go online and see what you can find out. You're able more than ever before to take charge of your own medical care. And it's probably a good idea to at least start that. Now, obviously, if studies are hidden, as Alan said, there's nothing you can do about it. But there's a lot you can find out, and there are a lot of treatments that are out there. And you want to take responsibility for yourself as much as you can, because you can so you can uh, avoid an awful lot of problems. But a good idea, Judge, of course, is to find out before you or your child before. takes a drug, because once they get on that regimen, it could be just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, to take them off that drug. I know we're not doctors. It's just an opine. Oh, yeah, but I, I'm saying, in, not just in drug things, but in general, yes. uh, you know your body and you, you know your kids, and you can go online, so it's probably a good idea to do that before the problems arise. Speaking of online, let's take one of your email questions. I believe this is from, is this a horse from, no, this is Dennis from Ewing, New Jersey. I don't understand why the whistleblowers get money out of this. Aren't they reporting criminal activity? Do people deserve rewards for just doing the right thing. Alan, how do you respond? Well, I would say that in my instance, uh, it, we are talking about civil as well as perhaps uh, criminal charges in my key Tom lawsuit. Uh, it was not a matter, a simple matter of me reporting to the authorities. I tried to report to the authorities. I tried for a year and a half to work through all channels in Pennsylvania that were available to me, and I was shut down. Uh, I had to engage private attorneys in the state of Texas to pursue the interests of the state of Texas and myself there. Um, it, I do not believe that any individual anywhere uh, can afford to go legally against pharmaceutical giants who make tens and hundreds of billions of dollars per year. The only way to do it is to enlist the legal profession and to uh, solicit the attention and the cooperation of uh, government, either state or federal uh, attorneys. Yeah. Steve Schellen, go ahead. Yeah, the, you know, the problem basically is that the government doesn't have the resources. They can't handle these cases. Mm -hmm. They have to have our assistance and our time and effort and discovery. Uh, and the other problem is this statute was passed back in after the Civil War. It's been used several times since, and it has been amended. And Congress realizes that without the incentive given to whistleblowers, they won't come forward. We need this. Sometimes the whistleblowers are involved in the conduct. We need to get them to come forward. I'd love to be able to find bin Laden, but we have to w offer rewards to people to turn them in. So far, they haven't done it yet, but in some instances, some of those bad actors have been turned in. This is necessary. We need to put a stop. It's costing our health care system billions of dollars. The best way to save money in our health care system is to take steps to stop drug advertising, which is prohibited in every country of the world except New Zealand and the United States. And the second best is to, uh, is to make certain that whistleblower statutes apply to the private citizen in private cases such as insurance companies and such as their own costs so they can come forward and recover their money on a whistleblower award type basis. Steve, Anita, are we going to see, are there more of these cases in the pipeline? I mean, I, I, I gave you a number. I, now, I don't know how many are against pharmaceutical companies, but there are nearly a thousand 
Ketam cases that are pending. All right, those aren't sealed, and I guess I should have been uh, clear about that. Steve, are there some cases that are sealed right now? Most, yeah, the way a Ketam case... Of course, see, some of yours might be sealed. Yeah, they'll be sealed to. as well, yeah. yes. Yeah. The way a Ketam case works is it's filed under court seal. It took five years before the Zyprexa seal was lifted. The government investigates. Sometimes they have FBI investigators, they have a grand jury sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on in the investigation. Uh, and the, the seal protects the relator because often, re meaning the whistleblower, because often they are sometimes still working for the company and they can work to cooperate with the government in their investigation, and they do. And this has helped us recover billions of dollars. There was no chance on earth that these two large recoveries, the largest in history, would have occurred without the whistleblowers who did, Anita, bo in both instances, try to get the company to change its behavior and failed miserably. And are there others pending? Yes. Will there be others pending? Yes. As was said by Mr. Jones and as I said by me, it will stop when we get some top CEOs in jail. Then maybe they'll stop. Or maybe when we get private rights to, for private insurance companies and hospitals, it'll save our health care system billions of dollars, and then maybe it will stop. And maybe we'll get honest development of drugs, no ghostwriting, a stopping of institutions like Stanford and Harvard from taking mil millions of dollars from these drugs companies to come up with science that I personally think is not just junk science but often garbage. Judge, we're not going to see these cases in courts of law. Why not? We're, well, we, we will someday, maybe. Uh, I think the basic... Oh, we haven't so far. I mean, I, I know was, I was being a, a little opinionated there. We haven't <laughs> seen them so far, and I think that this... I mean, it looks like the stakes would be almost well, too high. I mean, aren't these cases almost geared for settlement? Sure. Well, most cases are. Um, the... What? You know, the great majority of the civil cases settle. Um, but is there, the, I guess my question is, is there a certain danger, especially to the pharmaceutical industry, to have these cases in a court of law? Well, sure, because if, you know, if the numbers hit high, they, it, it, it's astronomical. I mean, in, in some kinds of the lawsuits, for example, in the asbestos cases, most of the companies went out of business. So there are real risks of trying to, to fight them out. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they did, you know, in some cases, it doesn't mean they did anything terrible. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but, but you, it's a risk-benefit analysis when you get the cases to settle. And because of the great risks, most of them will settle before going to trial. And, so, and let's go ahead. And the biggest the risk there is what I mentioned, the exclusionary, the, the power of the government to exclude the company from all federal uh, programs in the future, which means the company is dead. I mean, that, Folks, that, if you didn't get your question answered, you need more information, go to our website, lawjournaltv.com. Again, where we are birthing a new website, all of our programs will be up on the website shortly. If you need the need information in about two dozen different areas of practice, go to lawjournaltv.com. Call us toll free, 888-78-LAW-TV. Write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. Check us out on Facebook as well, the American Law Journal, and get your law on demand. I want to thank my guest, Anita Hotchkiss, representing the pharmaceutical uh, companies in complex litigation, the Honorable Richard Klein, now on the Superior Court in the state of Pennsylvania, actually since 2001. Stephen Scheller representing the plaintiffs in these matters. And Alan Jones, thanks uh, for joining us from Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. Alan, it was nice having your opinion with us on the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. This is the American Law Journal. Thanks for joining us. Until next week, case closed. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller PC, winning large verdicts for people injured by dangerous medicine, including antidepressants and antipsychotics, as well as medical malpractice and products liability claims. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Florida. Scheller, preserving the rights of the injured for over 30 years. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.